This is so much fun. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Nikita Visniak here with the amazing... Sydney Schindel. I'm the co-founder of Fiore Health and a certified nutritional practitioner. And the other amazing... I'm Lisa Kowalik. I am also a co-founder of Fiore Health. All right. Excellent. Yeah. And today we are going to be going through pain management through diet and nutraceuticals. This will be absolutely 100% relevant to you in practice, and it may change the way you treat every patient or client that you see. So over the course of the next hour and a bit, my goal and our goal here is to teach you a little bit about inflammation in the pain pathways, just to give you a little reminder, and then dive into how nutrition actually affects the pain pathways by modulating inflammation. Inflammation is at the key of all of this. We're going to list what contributes to inflammation in the first place, as well as some nutraceutical interventions for inflammation and pain, and leave you with some take home points, some ways that you can actually put this into practice. This sounds absolutely fantastic. Exactly what I need to know. This is going to be great. Perfect. All right. Well, I guess we're going to go ahead and start here with some pain pathways. So we can all think back to our neuroanatomy when we learned about spinal thalamic, posterior columns, spinal cerebellar tracts, all carrying information up from the body. But we have to realize that there are other key components that are involved with pain perception and the pieces of the pain puzzle. Number one, everybody likes to think of tissue damage, but there's also stress. There's your beliefs. There's the language that you use and the people that you're around in your social life, your relationships. Have you had previous injury? Your own beliefs are going to have a huge role in this. What the x-ray and radiology reports, it depends on what you're looking at. But one of the key things that we need to focus on here today is what can nutrition actually do to influence this? There is some great research, uh, some great articles, some meta-analysis and systemic reviews that we'll talk about a little bit later, but absolutely fantastic information here. So let's go ahead and continue on focusing on nutrition. Before we get into how food interrelates with pain, we need to understand that food is actually a method of cellular communication. It is more than the energy, it is more than energy, and it's actually how our body speaks. So our body talks to each other through chemical reactions. And what facilitates these chemical reactions are the vitamins, the minerals, the phytochemicals, our fatty acids, amino acids, and even the sugar that we're intaking. And so when we think of food, we can think that the food we're taking in, it either is going to perpetuate a pain response or it is going to promote a reduction in pain and pain symptoms. And the one really important thing about food before we move on is that food is actually the basis of our tissues and our cells and the quality of food we eat is going to directly correlate to the quality of our tissues and our cells. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, you, when you're eating food, you're either helping a disease process or fighting a disease process, right? Excellent, mm -hmm. fantastic. Tell us more. So another thing we have to address before we dive into kind of diets and dietary patterns and nutraceuticals is this concept of inflammation. And we hear the word inflammation all the time. We're talking about reducing inflammation. Everyone has too much inflammation, but we have to remind ourselves, even as practitioners, that inflammation is a vital part of the human immune system in the first place. It is that kind of May Day response that is released from our cells when they are, let's say, damaged, when there's some sort of sprain or strain or injury, or even even if there is some sort of pathogenic bacteria coming into the system. It's our cells way of saying, please help me, please bring the rest of our kind of army to this area to actually start to clean up the damage and fight the bad guys. So at that site of response, it's really important to remind ourselves that that is the key kind of player of what our inflammation kind of pathways are. In the first yeah, really, good, really good point there, Sydney. I think what happens for a lot of people, they think, well, I got to eliminate inflammation. I've got to cut it right down. Well, inflammation in a lot of ways is beneficial and serving a real process that you want to see happen. But sometimes it gets out of control or winds up lasting too long. And that's where I think this comes more into relevance. Absolutely. All right. Definitely. Plus more. And we have so many clients that come in saying, oh my gosh, I want to reduce inflammation. And that is one of their main goals, but they don't even understand what inflammation is in the first yeah. place. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, at that key player or at that key kind of um, base of what it is, it is an important process. But as you mentioned, if we don't address it, or if it is this kind of low hum of inflammation that we don't really notice, like that kind of systemic chronic inflammation that's a little bit more insidious, it can be a problem because even though technically acute inflammation at the site of injury is helpful, it's part of the healing process that's evolved with us over time as human beings, uh, it's a little bit different when it is in that systemic format because 
cellular changes can actually lead to systemic changes. We can see that this inflammation can actually upset what we like to call the Wi-Fi signal of different types of kind of uh, neurotransmitters and things that communicate throughout the body. So this can be an issue. And we have so many people who come in who are popping all sorts of different types of NSAIDs or pharmaceuticals to actually just reduce that pain because they've been told inflammation is bad. It's going to be a problem. It's going to cause cancer. It's going to cause all sorts of diseases. So we have to lower inflammation. Plus we're in pain. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I mean, it's maybe it's just, maybe it's only like a 5%, you know, to quantify it a little bit, 5% inflammation. Yeah. Oh, but I didn't sleep very well last night. Oh, oh and I'm gosh. having, I don't like my job. And it's all these things together that create a breakdown in the system, right? That's 100%. We talk about it as the bucket theory. There's only so much that you can kind of hold in your bucket before something spills over or it comes out in some way. Yeah. And, and with that being yeah. said, actually, it's really important to note too, that in the case of chronic pain, there's always the inflammatory component. Pain cannot exist without inflammation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And so yeah, we have all these people who are kind of looking at that short term answer of popping pills, and then not really addressing the fact that there's something going on underneath that a root cause, shall we say, uh, that we're not addressing. And so this can go on for weeks, months, years, and we end up with someone coming into an office saying, I have chronic low back pain, I have chronic headaches, I have migraines, and I need help. But we haven't kind of determined what the root cause is because we've been popping pills for so long, or we hate our job, or, you know, you name it. Yeah, yeah, excellent. All right, tell us more. So just a few things to think about when looking at chronic inflammation and some of the causes, obviously the mental emotional aspect is absolutely huge. It's so important. We're not going to address that here today, but we can look at things like leaving an acute injury infected or untreated for too long. And this actually does come down to diet because of the fact that most people are pretty protein deficient and we need those raw amino acids or kind of individual amino acids to ensure that we have enough to kind of support our immune system dietary patterns that we're going to talk about today, standard American diet being a pretty common one, and the result of obesity or kind of other hormonal things that can contribute to obesity, long-term exposure to irritants and different types of chemicals, including even just polluted air or polluted water, chronic stress, absolutely important to address. But once again, we're going to keep to diet here today, yeah. regular smoking, and obviously regular excessive alcohol consumption. Alcohol is inflammatory. Sorry, mm -hmm. but it is. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And there's some great studies out recently as well, talking about what, you know, the UK just actually lowered their recommended dosing for alcohol, just based on the inflammatory processes it involves. Right. Excellent. Okay. Tell us more. All right. So to dive into one of the reasons why inflammation is so important to address in chronic pain is a kind of hormone like factor called a prostaglandin. Now, prostaglandins are a group of hormone-like factors that are actually derived from polyunsaturated fatty acids, or PUFAs for short, and also because it's extremely fun to say. So PUFAs, <laughs> these polyunsaturated fatty acids, are actually going to be coming predominantly from food. Yes, there are some that we can make inside the body, but we have what we call our essential fatty acids, our omega-3 and our omega-6 uh, linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid that are going to be coming from food. And we can kind of shape shift these in the body to create other types of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now these do not get used in the same way as a lot of other dietary fats do. They actually line our cells. So that kind of faithful phospholipid bilayer or any type of phospholipid layer that we know in regular kind of biology uh, is actually made out of polyunsaturated fatty acids or predominantly out of these things. So they're hanging out all over the body and they can actually be converted into prostaglandins and they're created at the site of injury. And prostaglandins are used to create, sorry, to manage inflammation. Uh, some will promote inflammation while others actually resolve it. So we do need a balance of both before we kind of just vilify prostaglandins like we're so apt to doing of just throwing that out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really good point too, is everybody yeah. is, you know, black or white when really it's going to be oh great to get you through everything, right? Definitely, right? Because the body is constantly working to be in homeostasis, be it, you know, stress homeostasis or blood sugar homeostasis, or you name it, we need that balance of things. So it's never black and white. Mm -hmm. Now, these guys work at the site of uh, injury, and they are synthesized locally on demand, and they are actually not stored for future release. So they act locally in that area, and they don't really have distant sites of action. Uh, while 
other hormone-like factors do. These guys don't. They work at the site of action. Now, there are three series of prostaglandins. I'm just going to keep this brief, but it's important to understand that that balance is not black and white. It's shades of gray. Yep. Uh, we have prostaglandin series one that comes from DGLA, which is a type of omega-6 fatty acid, and it helps to decrease inflammation, but it's really found in the body in very low levels. Uh, we have prostaglandin series two, which comes from another type of omega-6 fatty acid called arachidonic acid. And this is meant to increase inflammation, water retention. It plays a role in kind of increasing blood vessel permeability. And that makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, because if we were running away from a tiger, if we were bit by a tiger, if we were kind of lacerated from different vines and trees, we would need some sort of hormone-like factor to help increase inflammation to bring, uh, let's say, different types of immune cells to that site of injury. Yeah, to, initi to initiate that local response, right? Which we still do. Absolutely. Exactly. But yeah. local being the key word there. And we'll kind of talk about how that goes awry in a modern day and a modern diet. And then last but not least is prostaglandin series three. This is like the ultimate hero, the ultimate good guy. And they are created from EPA, which is what we kind of use. Uh, we use this commonly with fish oils. We're looking at the uh, clostopentanoic acid coming from an omega-3 fatty acid found predominantly in fish coming from algae. And this molecule, this omega-3 fatty acid uh, helps to create an anti-inflammatory prostaglandin. It's extremely anti-inflammatory, so much so that it's the single most important factor for reducing the process of taking a macrodonic acid and turning it into prostaglandin series two. Mm -hmm. So this is important to note because PG series two uh, is is created from arachidonic acid and it is the best known lipid mediator that contributes to inflammatory pain. Super important to understand because that PG series two has the greatest impact on processing pain signals and the PG series two receptors are the well, most well-known and studied for their involvement in somatic pain. Really important to understand because our diet has gone from this relative balance of omega-3 to omega-6 to being extremely high in omega-6 and very little omega-3. So we have all of these kind of potentials for creating inflammation and creating PG series two, but very little in our arsenal of this omega-6 or of omega-3 that can create EPA or kind of turn into PG series three that can kind of lower the amount of inflammation in the body. Yeah, so we absolutely. see a lot of that. Yeah, absolutely. That's something we talk about. You have a copy of the nutrition book where we go through and show, you know, the basics of series three, series five, all that good stuff right there. Yeah. And again, it can seem overwhelming when you're first hearing this, but you guys are going to break it down for us for what we need to know in clinic and practice here eventually. So yeah, definitely. And just yeah. to kind of give you once again, that reminder that it's not black and white, and we do need a balance of these things. You can follow this flow chart just to look at the fact that we have, you know, exogenous sources of arachidonic acid coming from either omega-6s from, let's say, margarine, uh, different types of vegetable oils, or even from a little bit of meat as well, because it is high in arachidonic acid. And through the flow chart, we can create all sorts of different prostaglandin series too. And remember, they're important. They are predominantly pro-inflammatory, but they're used to increase vascular permeability, vasodilation, and platelet aggregation. Really important if we actually need to stop bleeding or to kind of help with damage in some sort of tissue. On the other end, we have that EPA coming from exogenous sources, and they can help us to create PG series three, which is anti-inflammatory and will help to, um, with platelet inhibition, inhibition, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> as well as the fact that this just literally being in the body actually helps to block the conversion of arachidonic acid into PG series two. So really important to understand that balance. Excellent. I, that's another key thing that you said right there too. realize that both of these pathways, all of these pathways are required for normal, yes. healthy life, but it's the balance that gets shifted off that can lead to ultimate pathologies and patients coming in with symptoms. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. And then to kind of touch on how dietary fats impact the whole body beyond the omega-3 and the omega-6 and how we can translate this into clinic, we need to talk about diets that contain fat. And so if you look in the research, we often see that low-fat diets are shown to decrease pain. And what we can kind of take away from this is that they do initially inhibit the pain response, but over the long term, they're going to perpetuate the pain response. And this is where we can look at the research and discern between what is research applicable and what is clinically applicable. And <laughs> Lisa, right there, that is absolutely huge. You need to say that again, because a lot of people look at the results and like, well, it's shown to decrease inflammation. But what you're saying is short-term and long-term, there's very different outcomes that we see with it. 
Yes, and of course, no matter how good a research study is, even when they're incorporating the confounding variables, it's never going to be 100% translatable into a bio-individual human. So mm -hmm. that is something to, <clears throat> sorry, to keep in mind. And what we typically see with a low-fat diets and their positive effect on pain has nothing to do with the lowered amount of fat and everything to do with the decreasing of processed foods and the increasing of whole foods. Stop. Say that. Say that sentence again. That is golden right there for people to realize. <laughs> the low-fat diet, and actually this is across the board in nutrition research, usually the, the mechanism of action behind every diet is the same. It is the removal of processed food and the addition of the whole foods. Hmm. I wonder if there's going to be a quiz at the end of this, if that won't be one of the answers <laughs> to the questions right there, right? Fantastic. All right, tell us more. And so when we kind of dig further into the research, what we actually see is that low carbohydrate diets versus the low fat diets have a better long-term response to pain. And again, this isn't because of the lowered amount of carbohydrates, though it is because the type of carbohydrates that are usually consumed are inflammatory. But we can translate this into clinic by if we are going to put our clients on some sort of dietary modification, doing the lower carb with the good fats is what is going to produce the long-term results. And this is because of course, the fats are involved in the prostaglandin series, but healthy fats are required for sustained pain management in, and this is going to depend on what kind of pain, but for example, in arthritic pain, healthy fats go in and they act as lubrication. And when things are lubricated, pain is automatically going to go down. And then we also- but even that, let's, let's, let's say that one again right there too, because for a lot of our listeners who are going to be watching this, that's going to be a huge thing. Joint pain. I mean, your likelihood of having osteoarthritis by the time you're 65 is almost hundred percent. You will have it somewhere. And there'll be some kind of degeneration of cartilage. Now, us lubricating those joints and eliminating pain, those are going to be key functional outcomes that we can reach for patients right there. So you can see the good aspects that you're associating with this different fatty acids that we're eating, right? So excellent. Of course. And then even to compound on that, fat doesn't just contain fat. It contains different polyphenols and different fat-soluble vitamins and um, a lot of different yeah, fatty acids that we actually don't really get except from like meats and stuff. So we just need to have a very well-rounded diet that includes a lot of different sources of healthy fats. Um, and then even here, we can see that there's certain polyphenols that down regulate genes that are associated with osteoarthritis. And so from that, we can even basically say that fats can have an epigenetic change on the body. Yeah. And <laughs> to again, further compound that, when we have a lot of rancid fats in the diet, those are what is contributing to the inflammatory process and not to get too technical, but we have our NF kappa B marker and the <clears throat> NF alpha, <clears throat> sorry, the TNF alpha. And those markers are really stereotypical of chronic pain and inflammation. And we know that the addition of rancid fats, which is basically any fat that has a bond broken, yeah. which again, we're going to find in all of those processed foods. So even something as simple as reducing the processed foods and increasing the whole foods, as we've spoke about already, is going to elicit a large improvement in clients very quickly. Yes. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I could, this is this is absolutely fantastic information to get right here. Like you're giving us the technical information behind it, but it goes back to simple, basic changes that are often hard to get people to do, but that will result in so much better outcomes for the person involved with it. Fantastic. All right, tell 100%. us more. And before we even dive into the next slide, I think it's important to note that when the word or the term low carb diets gets thrown around, people automatically assume keto. And that is definitely not the same thing yeah. by any means. Yeah, we uh, talk about all the different diets we, and we, we put low carb carb, all kinds of stuff in here. So we put about 20 different diets, but exactly that. Yeah. Make sure you're really researching that well, but exactly what you said, Lisa, it's really going to be multiple sources, organic, free range, whatever you can find sources yeah. that are going to be your best outcomes. Right. Okay. And Excellent. whatever diet we're putting patients or clients on, if we're not giving them the macronutrient breakdown, if it's just more whole foods, they're going to intuitively eat the ratios that are right for them. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And the research supports that too. Excellent. Because your body Definitely. knows what it needs. So it'll go find that nutrient out in the environment. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So a uh, kind of take home point that we can start to share with you here is a way to choose better fats is by focusing on increasing omega threes while decreasing omega sixes. And the easiest way to do this with clients is to ask them what types of oils they cook with. And if they use margarine versus butter, please, please, please. If you have clients that are eating margarine, 
please ask them to stop. It is not heart health the way that they once thought it was. And it is something that can contribute to inflammation because of the fact that it is something that is damaged and broken in terms of the bonds, as well as the fact that it's just made up of omega-6s. So reducing and removing vegetable oils like corn, um, mazola, canola, all of those types of oils are definitely something to recommend Peanut. and to replace it. <laughs> Peanut, soy, all of those. And obviously slowly, but surely trying to just replace them with something rather than saying, please don't eat this, always giving them an option instead. And ways that we can do that is actually focusing on using olive oil and avocado oil. Avocado oil holds up to higher heat for sure. But if you're choosing a high quality olive oil, preferably something that's first cold pressed coming from one area of the world, you actually see an crazy high amount of polyphenols. That peppery aftertaste that you can find in a good quality olive oil is actually representing a lot of the antioxidant content that's found in that oil. So you get a literal health food, not just something to cook with. Nice. Fantastic. Yeah. And one of my favorite, one of my, just on a simple one, one of my favorite is just going to have a nice homemade sourdough bread, just dipping it in some oil and a little bit of vinegar. It's fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. And even that in comparison to someone eating wonder bread with margarine is actually a huge step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Um, also looking at increasing your take of fish, wild fish, uh, oily fish. So sardines, anchovies, uh, salmon, if you can find it, please wild, not farmed. And then opting for grass fed beef, if that is an option for your clients and patients, because it is more expensive, but just to break this down quite quickly, we are what we eat eats. And when our food eats things like grains and corn and soy mash, which is what conventional beef is raised on, their fatty tissue is full of omega-6s. If we find that we're eating grass-fed beef, it actually has a higher amount of omega-3s in it and CLA, which is quite important for reducing inflammation as well. So opting for grass-fed beef, grass-fed and finished is really important if someone can afford to do that. Absolutely. I mean, even for, for ourselves, we have our own flock of chickens, we have about 20 chickens, and we, we have to buy a store-bought egg versus one of the chickens that's out free range, eating all the bugs and everything like this. The actual quality of the egg is substantially different. You can see the color in the yolk, you can feel it in the taste, and it's just eating things the way that they're supposed to be naturally is going to result in way better outcomes for you. Yeah. 100% mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. yeah. All right. And another thing to be mindful of is saturated fat intake. This is something that has shifted in, in terms of the dialogue around saturated fats in the last two years. Uh, they actually had to reverse some of the things that were mentioned about saturated fat and coronary heart disease. We'll not get into that in this lecture, maybe a future one, but uh, just to give you a little kind of summary of this, saturated fat in itself is not necessarily the issue. It seems to be when we combine high amounts of saturated fat with high amounts of processed carbohydrates that it becomes an issue for inflammation and cardiovascular disease. Uh, but the type of saturated fat also matters in terms of its association with pain. It seems that short and medium chain saturated fatty acids don't have any effect on pain at all, whereas longer chain uh, saturated fatty acids can potentially uh, cause more pain when combined with very high carb diets. So we're talking about the standard American diet of burgers and fries and milkshakes, right? Yeah. And yeah. the problem, the problem with it for people though, is that combination of the high carbohydrate, high fat at a 50, 50% ratio is so addictive. It's so addictive. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. absolutely addictive. And so opting for grass fed butter, ghee, coconut oil for cooking, higher smoke points anyways. So you can actually cook with that uh, without uh, as much fear of it turning into a trans fat in the first place, which we definitely should avoid uh, as well as grass fed and pastured meats as much as possible. Obviously avoiding trans fats here. Um, most countries have had some sort of ban on that, but just to go back to Lisa's points about rancid fats and fats that don't really shape us. Uh, fit in the mold per se, when we have that trans fat, it's kind of like putting a puzzle piece in the wrong piece of the puzzle. And it can, you kind of jam it in there and it kind of affects the rest of the puzzle. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Right. And it looks like it might fit. Eh, something's a little bit off, but that's the yeah. whole, that's the whole start of this entire inflammatory cascade that we're looking at for people right here. Right. Putting the wrong puzzle pieces in the puzzle, making it look like something that's going to work when it actually doesn't. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Tell us more. Okay, so now we're going to segue from fats into our carbohydrates. And of course, we know that we need carbohydrates. Um, the good carbohydrates are good. But what we need to talk about is the simple carbohydrates and the sugar and insulin piece as it relates to chronic pain. So sugar or glucose is pro-inflammatory. And that's something to keep in mind. Next, we have insulin, which is anti-inflammatory. And just to give a background on how sugar and insulin work together, when sugar comes into the body and goes into the bloodstream, insulin gets secreted and insulin takes the sugar into the cells. And so we have the inflammatory sugar sitting in the blood 
uh, blood vessels, and then we have insulin taking the inflammatory substance out of the blood into the cells where it is used. So from this, we can kind of understand that when somebody is more insulin resistant, they're automatically going to be in an inflammatory state because insulin resistance means that the sugar is sitting in the bloodstream because the cells aren't responding to the insulin. Yeah. And that's, I mean, one of the reasons why we see with type two diabetes mellitus, when we're looking at that, we see cases of vascular inflammation, neurodegeneration bilaterally, symmetrically occurring because of the chronic stage of inflammation. The problem is for most people, they don't have those ultra high level symptoms. It's just kind of a low level inflammation, like we've been talking about. So they tend not to do too much about it. Exactly. And what happens when that glucose is sitting in the bloodstream is the inflammation damages the blood vessels. And we often think of blood vessels just in our cardiovascular health. But what we often forget is that our blood vessels are what take oxygen and nutrients to all of our tissues. And so when the blood vessels are damaged and we have vasoconstriction, we actually don't get the nutrients that we need to our tissues and our cells and the oxygen. And the really important piece here is that we all know that tissues that are not sufficiently oxygenated are damaged and they can become almost necrotic. And so when we, um, yeah, when we don't have that flow of oxygen, and of course this isn't, you know, if you put an oxygen saturation measure on your finger, you're still gonna, you know, it's still gonna be 96, but it's when it's those, that little decrease in oxygen available to the cells, we just see an increase of the pathological process um, at an insane amount. And so when we have that glucose sitting in the bloodstream and we're restricting the oxygen and the nutrients, whatever tissue is already damaged is going to become further damaged. And then yeah. we start that um, inflammatory process again, and then- Well, it's almost like a double hit, right? Because basically mm -hmm. you've got all the glucose sitting there. So you're gonna see this inf inflammation is gonna be there. And oh, well, guess what? The oxygen isn't getting as well in there. So you're being hit, not enough oxygen and your inflammation right now. And when you're looking at this, the prime example, you said almost necrotic. No, absolutely. The end stages of diabetes, you can go look at a diabetic foot. It is people getting their toes, their ankles amputated off because the tissue literally dies on your body because of this inflammatory process. Exactly. And so when we think about that in pain, you can yeah picture that diabetic foot and that's what's happening to organs, to joints, to tissues that are being affected by the pain. So when we can give them what they need, they can start to work better. And we usually see in this insulin resistance picture, um, all of these different types of inflammatory markers. And I just wanna to touch on one, the CRP, C-reactive protein. This is the gold standard inflammatory marker. And so this is kind of a, just a little clinical pearl that you can use. This is on yeah, every single blood panel. And when this marker is high, there's always going to be some sort of chronic issue. And so in chronic pain patients, this marker will be elevated. And when you start to implement dietary interventions, this marker should be going down. And so you can always send your patient to a doctor's office to get a requisition for this. It's very simple. And if it's coming down, that means that the pain responses are also going to be positively affected. However, if that's coming down and there's still pain present, then it's worth looking into the psychological nature yes. of this pain. Yeah, excellent. That's that's such a really, really important point to say again. I mean, a couple of things there that come to mind whenever I'm ordering a blood panel and you look at C-reactive protein, well, it's a non-specific marker of inflammation in the entire body is what you're looking at, right? So it's always difficult. Well, it could be there for multiple different reasons, but exactly what you said, when you're seeing the levels dropping of C-reactive protein, but the person's pain is staying the same, you need to look for other causes potentially to that pain generation for them, right? Inflammation may have only played a minor role in the pain perception that that person is actually having. Exactly, but at least the physiological process of the pain is likely going down. And so it's important to yeah, hit it from the subjective and the objective markers with the patients, you know, verbally well, that's, yeah. explaining. That's exactly back to this, right? That is, well, what's going on? Did mm -hmm. you sleep really well? What's the language that I'm using? Are you under a lot of stress? What previous injuries have you had, right? What are the goals we're focusing on? All of that. Yeah, definitely. And to add in a little bit of that coaching aspect that, um, you know, comes sometimes to some people innately and others, not so much uh, the, the language that we use and listening and picking up on the cues that those patients and clients are kind of saying, and maybe let's say them being wrapped around their story of pain or wrapped around what their other doctor said about pain and holding on to that. 
listening and kind of perking up your ears to see if that's kind of part of their repetitive story or picture that they keep bringing in is really important to pick up on. Yeah, absolutely. Many people define themselves by their condition. Oh, I have diabetes, so I can't do this. Oh, I have scoliosis, so I can't do this kind of thing, right? Yeah. And to actually relate that back to physiology, when people are stuck in their pain stories like that, we they actually create molecules that are inflammatory in nature. Yes. And so it is this cycle. And so even though there is that mental component, the mental emotional, it translates into our physiology. <laughs> That's right. What you think becomes real. You make it real through your own thought processes. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. Tell us more. I am excited about this. Great. <laughs> Um, okay, and then another nutrition piece is antioxidant status. So we know that oxi antioxidants combat what we know as free radicals. Um, we need this balance in the body. And when there's more free radicals than there are antioxidants, we start to see oxidative stress. And oxidative stress basically contributes to every pathology, but it the oxidative stress is what perpetuates the inflammatory response. Um, and it also is highly correlated to neuropathy, which is super important. And what we know about antioxidants is that the amount of antioxidants we are taking in from the diet is going to depend or it's going to basically dictate what our endogenous antioxidant system is doing. And so we have this system and it's made up of glutathione peroxidase, catalase and superoxide dismutase. And this antioxidant system is going to govern the amount of inflammation in the body. And so when this system is compromised and Usually we see a systemic uh, compromisation of it, but sometimes it can be higher in one tissue and then lower in another. But the important thing is, is when there's not enough antioxidants coming in, this system gets depleted. And it gets depleted because when there's not a lot of antioxidants coming in, it usually means there's a lot of free radicals coming in. So we can think of, you know, you eat a big salad, lots of antioxidants, you eat a burger, you're getting no antioxidants and a bunch of the free radicals that the body then needs to use its own sources to kind of clean up. And yes, so when this happens through the standard American diet, we start to see systemic oxidative stress, which again promotes that inflammatory response. And we know from research that the standard American diet, likely through this antioxidant inflammatory relationship, um, creates inflammatory mediators that sensitize the peripheral afferent neurons, which we know has a lot to do with how we perceive our pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes right back to the pain pathway, spinal thalamic. Even if you look at different tissues where you have free nerve endings versus Meisner's and proscenium corpuscles, all that is influenced on a systemic level, but also what you were talking about here too, looking at the balance between antioxidants coming in and, you know, free radicals. That's a lot of thing that pe people don't, a lot of items that people don't really pay attention to, right? That we have to definitely incorporate as part of our discussion and understanding of the overall diet and the inflammatory process. Exactly. And when it comes to relating this clinically, if we just increase antioxidant status, patients likely aren't going to see a, a noticeable reduction in pain. However, if we do not increase the antioxidant status, whatever protocol you put them on won't be sustained long-term. Mm. So they're not the be all end all, but they are a, an important piece of the puzzle that sets the foundation for everything else to work. Yeah, yeah, excellent, good. As a lover of analogies, I really like to share this one with clients just because sometimes we can explain this to clients until once again, we're blue in the face or we're so excited about it, but it doesn't quite make sense to them. So the way that I like to explain the dietary versus endogenous antioxidant system is kind of like an antioxidant recycling program. And so we need to make sure that we have these different kind of uh, types of antioxidants, both coming from exogenous and endogenous sources to recycle one and another to kind of keep the whole system running. And I find that I get positive results when I explain that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. And that's what patients like is they like simple analogies that we'll talk about this cycle, this feeds this and this goes back to that. And we just, yeah. this, you know, common, common loop occurring here. Excellent. Yeah, I can. All right. Tell us more. Right. So another piece of the puzzle here is gut health and understanding uh, gut health and nutrient deficiencies. So we've talked at length already about how poor dietary patterns can lead to inflammation and can actually affect our pain pathways and our pain sensitivity. So I won't go into too much detail there, but we have to also understand that the food that we eat can actually affect our digestive system and our digestive tract. So in, in simple terms, our digestive tract is literally like a tube that's exposed to the outside world. It's like a bendy straw that swirls through our body and it actually is exposed to outside 
things, right? Like pathogens, like different types of bacteria and viruses, and obviously different types of bugs, right? So our microbiome plays a pretty big role in kind of keeping our digestive tract healthy. Now, the food that we eat can support this, or it can also kind of work against us because our cells in our digestive tract are only one cell layer deep. So to give you an example, this is kind of what our cells look like. They're like these little finger-like projections um, that kind of sit um, side by side like this. And when we have inflammation and irritation from food that let's say isn't of great quality, we have uh, inflammatory fats, we've got different types of bugs coming into the system. We can actually start to see that those tight junctions that hold those cells together nice and tight end up becoming a little bit looser. So we end up with something called intestinal permeability, a fancy term for what they call leaky gut. It's the scientific term is intestinal permeability. No. Yeah, and so, yeah, and there's a couple of key things to make sure that we understand there too. Like, I mean, even if you're looking at taking broad spectrum antibiotics or whatever yeah. else it is, you can be looking at other injuries as well. Like you're, you're effectively looking at wiping out the flora and fauna of your entire GI tract, yes. right? Exactly. And so that in turn can also be quite problematic to the entire system because we are more microbe than human. There are way more of them inside our bodies than actual human cells. And yeah. so they play this very important role in keeping our gut healthy, but also our entire system healthy. They play a role in cytokine secretion, in neurotransmitter creation, and we need to make sure that we are supporting a healthy gut microbiome to ensure that we in turn are healthy uh, as well. I'll, so, just go in a, I'll just go on a yeah. little bit of a tangent right here. We'll come back to this okay, in a second, but it, absolutely. When you're looking at this, it's not that you are really the bacteria that exists on your body, the balance yeah. of everything. So that means going to play in the dirt, walking in nature, giving somebody else a hug. You are sampling each other's microbiome when you do that. Right. All right. I just wanted to make sure that was clear on everybody's radar. So, okay. And it's so important, right. Especially, you know, now that people are a little bit more concerned around keeping things clean, we need to have a little bit of exposure to microbes. We need it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, well, we can talk about that forever, but I'll keep it on track here. Okay. So the other thing to take note of here is that when we have, let's say an imbalance of gut bacteria, or we have exposure to foods that can cause inflammation or a combination of these things, which is mostly uh, what ends up happening, we can see cases of chronic inflammation occurring from the gut and extending outwards, as well as food sensitivities. And so this can show up as pain. This can show up as a root cause of migraines and headaches, uh, as well as in cases of fibromyalgia, even in cases of pain of osteoarthritis, we can see that food sensitivities can be a cause of this and leading back to where that could have started. It's probably due to some sort of upset in our gut, be it dysbiosis, intestinal permeability, or some sort of blend of these things all together. So there's a lot of really cool research around using elimination diets or using diets that actually remove processed food to see a, a change in pain perception. And it's really cool research on that. Yeah. Uh, the other piece to look at is nutrient deficiencies. And I love talking about nutrient deficiencies with clients because we have so many people who come in counting calories or following a specific dietary approach. And they're focusing only on the caloric content or the macronutrient content of protein, carbs, and fats. And that's kind of like watching a movie and only looking at like Brad Pitt and kind of thinking about like who he is and like watching him. But we forget about the fact that there's a whole film crew in the background. There's a director, there's, uh, you know, um, makeup, hair, all those people that make Brad Pitt look good. And that's basically what nutrients do, right? In a nutshell. And I love sharing that with clients because it makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. And if we are ignoring the fact that we need those nutrients in the picture, Brad Pitt's not going to look so good. And in turn, we don't look so good either. So nutrient deficiencies are a big part of chronic pain. And the ones that we find that are quite common are omega-3 fatty acids, like 90 something percent of people have been proven to be deficient in omega-3 fatty acids. Mm -hmm. It's a really complicated pathway. Even if we're eating flax and chia, the percentage of flax and chia that's actually converted into EPA and DHA is minute. We're talking 4% for EPA and like less than a percent for DHA. So yeah. getting it through fatty fish sources or through supplementation is definitely ideal. B vitamins as well, B1, B3, B6, B12 are all known to be linked to chronic pain when they are deficient. Vitamin D is a really, really big one. Um, I think Lisa had a fun fact about that one as well. Yeah, there was quite a large study that showed that 96% of patients with chronic pain were massively deficient in vitamin D. So supplementation with that is a really easy fix. Yeah, yeah. supplementation and sun exposure, right? Those would be the two of course. Things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And depending on where you are in the world too, we have to kind of be mindful that, you know, so many people can be deficient through the winter months and even in summer months, depending on where they are. So getting those levels checked easily done through a doctor and just to kind of see where they're at. 
Well, it's not even where they are. It's what they wear too, right? Like if you're always bundled up and there's next to no skin exposure to the sun, you're going to see decreased vitamin D levels just across the board, right? Definitely. And actually sunglasses block a lot of the conversion of vitamin D as well. So ensuring you're outside like as much or as fully exposed as you can be is a great way to increase the levels. Mm -hmm. Nice. Good tips. All right. Magnesium, zinc, beta carotene, all of those things are also quite important. And then the last but not least is amino acids. So protein deficiency has also been linked to chronic pain and chronic inflammation. Such a huge component there to focus on with clients is, and patients is to understand if they're getting enough protein. People are kind of afraid of eating too much and thinking about liver failure for the bulk of the population. That's not going to be an issue, making sure that they get protein in the correct portion for them is quite important and far above what the recommended daily intake is suggested by government kind of regulations is usually indicated in most individuals. Because if you think about it, that is the bare minimum of what is required to function and run. For sure. And then of course, it's got to be the good quality, good sources of protein too, right? A lot of people misinterpret that as well. And they think they're going to take their whey protein with very few, you know, isolates in it and stuff. And then you're all of a sudden just looking at this monoculture that doesn't really support what we've been talking about the entire way through. Exactly. All right. So I'm a clinician. I'm in practice. I'm trying to figure out what's the right way to go with the patient when I'm going to be working with them. Should I be going to supplements or should I be just doing diet only? What's the right balance in your opinions? A yes. Good question. So that is a great question. And it's kind of a bit of a balancing act. Yeah. So if you are having somebody that is presenting with chronic pain for a long time, their physiology has been altered for a very long time. And so we kind of need to go in and hit it hard and correct that. And diet, what, how I like to look at it is that nutraceuticals are going to be good in the short term to you know, start providing symptomatic relief, but also to establish the trust between practitioner and patient. When you give your patients or clients something that's gonna make them feel better right away, they're gonna trust you to make the, lo- uh, the longer and larger changes, such as you know, overhauling their entire diet. Yeah, that's and huge. So- Lisa, let's just say that again, because that's huge. A lot, of, a lot of clinicians don't realize that. You have to build that trust first, offer yes. them some kind of almost instant changes, something that they're going to work on that they can actually facilitate some kind of result right away and then switch over to that longer term, what's probably going to serve them better, really, modifications that they're going to wind up doing. Yeah, exactly. And so when it comes to pain patients, one of the easiest things to do is simply switching out their NSAID for a natural anti-inflammatory because most people are going to be taking the NSAIDs anyways. And what the thing with the NSAIDs are is that they, of course, they inhibit the pain pathway. But like we talked about at the very beginning of this, they do nothing to mediate the immune response. And so what we're basically seeing is a reduction in pain temporarily, but that inflammatory response is still playing in the background and inflammation feeds inflammation. And and so through the use of NSAIDs, we're actually promoting pain for a longer, for basically their lifetime, um, if we're not using other remedies to stop their pain. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And never, never mind the side effects of prolonged NSAID use, right? Effects on the GI tract, everything else that we're looking at. So yeah. Yeah. And then one more thing just to add there uh, is that coming back to patient trust is that when you have someone who has a story or who just has been in pain for a very long period of time, there there's a level of fear around making change. Right. And so giving them something to add on rather than taking away is such an important piece of that puzzle because if we start to remove things right away by saying no more this no more that without giving Mm -hmm. them anything as an offering like quite literally as a peace offering you're probably not going to see them back in your office exactly you're giving them the gift of something new to try that's what you're doing right there right and you're giving them you know another option that they can look through so it actually winds up exactly what you said instead of being this negative don't do this elimination diet you can't do anything it's like nope we're going to make a little baby step micro change and see how this does yeah yeah Mm -hmm. And so when we can add in a nutraceutical for pain, it's passive for them. And passive is good, especially when somebody is in pain. So if we see here, we have three different anti-inflammatories, and these are what the research shows to be the most effective, but more importantly, it is what clinically we see to be very effective. Nice. So the first one, I'm assuming everybody has heard of curcumin and curcumin is 
arguably the best anti-inflammatory that we can give a patient. And the thing with curcumin is, is it is not bioavailable. It's really hard for the body to take in. And so the quality of the curcumin matters. And so if you do have somebody that you've given curcumin before and it hasn't worked, it's not the curcumin, it is the quality and the dosing of the curcumin. So we know that cur curcumin is anti-inflammatory, which you know we've already discussed at length as to why that's important. Um, but a unique feature of curcumin is it increases the superoxide dismutase levels. So even if the diet isn't Great. it's going to preserve that glutathione antioxidant system, yep. which we need. And so those little, you know, baby incremental steps up are going to yield profound results. And then the nice thing about curcumin too, is it is also a COX-2 inhibitor. So it's going to have the exact same effect as an NSAID without the side effects. And it's not only increase or decreasing pain temporarily, it is stopping the process at the root so that the pain isn't going to be perpetuated. Exactly. So if so you do... Yeah, sorry, so that's if you that do, pathway. <laughs> sorry, I'm just excited because that's the pathway that I was excited to share about prostaglandins. That's uh, the one that blocks the conversion of arachidonic acid to PG2. Yeah, yes. And so, when we basically you can take anybody's Advil, ibuprofen, Tylenol, whatever they're using, swap it out for a high quality curcumin, and they can't help but see some sort of improvement. Um, so dosing with curcumin is going to be variable, a good quality curcumin. Um, anywhere between one and three capsules a day, but the milligrams are all going to vary and every company is going to have a patent because there needs to be a patent in order to make it bioavailable. Yeah. Um, next, we have PEA, and this is going to be really important in chronic pain patients, and this works really well with the curcumin. So PEA is a long chain fatty acid that our body actually produces. And the important thing to know with this is that as inflammation increases in the body, the PEA production skyrockets. And it does that because it is a natural anti-inflammatory and analgesic. The caveat to this is when there is inflammation for a long time, essentially the body is like, okay, there's a lot of inflammation. We're going to just stop making this because it's obviously not doing anything. And the PEA levels in the body drop. And so when you can supplement with PEA in the initial stages of this chronic inflammatory response before um, kind of like a pre-protocol, yeah, yeah. we're just increasing the level of PEA back to normal in the body, which in itself is, yeah, anti-inflammatory and analgesic. So we're going to clinically see them feeling better because they're just being topped up in something that they should already have. Mm -hmm. And what we tend to see with PEA is there will be that acute relief of pain, but as it builds back up in the body, we're going to see the progressive reduction in pain which is important because, so with the curcumin, you take it, you feel better instantly. With this, you know, give it about two weeks to a month, depending on the person. And the longer they've been in pain, the longer it's gonna take to see the result with this because their levels are probably close to zero. And in the research, we do see it works really well with low back pain, pelvic pain, TMJ, osteoarthritis, and also there's a lot of research of it in di diabetic neuropathy. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing to point out too, though. Like, I mean, just as a basic principle for a clinician counseling a patient on what they're going to be doing with the different nutraceuticals mm -hmm. is the longer the inflammation or process has been there, probably the longer it's going to take for us to break it down and to realize it might take a little bit longer with some of these mechanisms. And Absolutely. another thing to touch on with that is just uh, your patient's body awareness, right? If they don't have that mind-body connection of being quite body aware of, you know, what causes pain or how much pain they're in, uh, it can be something that they might not pick up on right away, or it might not be something that's as obvious as it would be for someone who is uh, more body aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that again, even comes back to us as the clinicians, we have to have good outcome markers where we can measure, okay, you came in and your exactly. pain was a five and now it's a four, or you could only walk three kilometers and now you can walk three and a half kilometers. These are big differences right here, right? Celebrating the wins. Yeah. Yep. Celebrate the small victories. That's what you want to do. Absolutely. And actually one thing to keep in mind on this topic is sometimes I'll have clients come back and they'll think something's not working and I'll be like, okay, that's fine. Let's, you know, let's stop the curcumin and the PEA if it's not working, but because it was working and it was just, you know, these little increments and their, yeah. their new normal, you know, kind of went up, yeah. they, they're like, oh, it's not working. It's not working. I'm still in pain. And then you remove it. And then they realize how much the yeah. improvement actually happened. And so that's a kind of a good way also to help clients become more aware of where they started and where they are. And so in terms of dosing for the PEA, this is also going to be variable, but usually we want to have about 400 to 600 milligrams 
one to three times a day. And again, this is just going to depend on the length that they've been in chronic pain and then, you know, do it for about two months, three months, and then you can stop it because once the levels are up again, there's no need to continue supplementation with that. Nice. That's a huge point to make as well, because you don't want it to be like a medication. I mean, what's the ideal medication for big pharma? You're on it for your entire life. Here you mm -hmm. can actually see a resolution of symptoms and a degradation, a decrease in the actual supplementation you need to take as well. Fantastic. Excellent. Exactly. We don't want to do green allopathic medicine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so when the next one, um, you know, again, we've already talked about this at length, so I'm not going to go into detail, but omega-3 supplementing with the EPA and DHA. The ratio of this is going to depend on the type of pain. So EPA is more for like the inflammatory type of pain. And then DHA is more for the neurogenic pain, which of course is going to have the inflammatory component. But if there is sort of like any nerve pain, just increasing the DHA will increase clinical results. And the important thing to note with the supplementation of EPA and DHA always are using companies that are third party tested for heavy metals, yes. because if we're ingesting heavy metals, that's going to perpetuate the pain response. And then also looking at the dosage. So typically speaking, we're going to say, see a thousand milligrams is what we need, but that is way too low. You will not see clinical outcomes with that in chronic pain. You need to have, you know, anywhere between three and 5,000 milligrams of a good quality one to, to start to see the difference. Okay. Good to and know. The other important thing about that is you'll have so many clients coming in because omega threes are so well marketed uh, by supplement companies that they'll come in saying, I take a fish oil, I have a thousand milligrams, uh, but it's actually just a thousand milligrams of fish oil. So teaching clients about the EPA and looking for the EPA and DHA content on the back in the milligrams, not just the fish oil milligrams is something that's a bonus point for them. And I find that you kind of get on their side when you can bring up whatever brand that they have and be like, well, look at what they're charging you, but look at the actual therapeutic dose in there. And so they're actually cheating you out of what you could be getting from a higher costing, but more therapeutic company. Yeah, and ex that's exactly. That's, happens. that's a whole nother lecture topic in itself. <laughs> right there going through that. My favorite is when people advertise potatoes as cholesterol free. I'm just like, what? <laughs> okay. Yeah. You see yeah. the boxes, but anyways, I know. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Very marketing funny. marketing is a talk we could oh my gosh it could go yeah, off for yeah. a long time <laughs> all right but, this is so, this is great information lisa tell us more on this yeah um yeah so just one more thing on the omega-3s a low quality omega-3 will have the fish oils in it but it also will have carrier oils which are going to be the vegetable mm. oils so the yeah, safflowers yeah. the sunflower are very common and so it is really important when recommending supplements across the board to make sure that it's from a reputable brand, that it is third party tested for all of these and that the bioavailability is there and that there's not ingredients that are going to promote, you know, the degraded physiology. And we want to make sure that the supplements we're giving are promoting the homeostasis in the body. And so, um, yeah, there's lots of resources out there, but that's just something really to keep in mind. If you're not quite sure on which ones to use, what brands to always just ask because you can do more harm than good if you prescribe a bad brand. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really, really good point because you're taking, you're taking a nutraceutical that has both pluses and minuses, even though it's supposed to be advertised as only pluses in it. Right. So yes. yeah. Yeah. All right. And then, yeah, I guess we'll just segue into a case study on how we've used nutrition and nutraceuticals to bring down um, a client's pain. Mm -hmm. okay. So I had a client who was 62 years old or is, he was 62 at the time. And he came in presenting with psoriatic arthritis, osteoarthritis, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, BPH, and psoriasis. So clearly a lot of inflammation going on. Uh, when you looked at him though, uh, just objectively speaking, he was very handsome, healthy, good looking 62 year old male, retired, happy, uh, very active, plays pickleball four to five times a week, goes for hour long walks every day, maybe has 10, 15 pounds to lose, but generally a healthy looking individual. Uh, he was on methotrexate at the time for the psoriatic arthritis in his fingers, uh, Jardians for, um, uh, sorry, for diabetes, Ramipril, Allopurinol, and Tamalosin. So lots of different things going on there in terms of his medications. Uh, as far as family history goes, there was definitely a history of psoriasis, heart disease, diabetes, and his son actually has ankylosing spondylitis. And we've actually been using PEA for that too, which is he's seen great relief with, which is really neat. Uh, but for back to him. Um, retired, generally eats a pretty healthy diet after looking at a food log from him, doesn't smoke and has very little to no alcohol, especially after introducing the methotrexate into his uh, regime. So the big thing about a clean eating diet or a general clean diet is that people will come up and say that, but when you kind of look into it a little bit deeper, you might notice that things might be missing. And so for him, 
in fear of you know creating more inflammation he had basically tried to cut out all animal products uh, no red meat very little protein coming from animal sources a little bit of chicken and fish now and again but generally actually a very low protein diet moderate fat intake and a very high carbohydrate intake granted they were from more whole food carb sources we're talking uh, different types of legumes different types of grains that were whole but relatively a higher carbohydrate diet moderate to low-ish fat intake and very low protein so this was actually a big piece of the puzzle for him when we started to look at interventions was actually increasing his protein and getting him comfortable with eating more than like a palm worth of protein at every meal. For him, he was eating one chicken thigh and thinking that that was sufficient, whereas he clearly needed more, not just for his case, but also for the amount of activity that he performed on a daily basis. He required more amino acids for that, especially in the morning. Uh, he was eating a lot of, um, he was eating um, bran buds, bran buds with a little bit of bananas and yogurt, kind of that typical uh, meal that was sold as the perfect breakfast food. So we swapped that out for protein. We increased his water intake immensely. He was uh, part of the generation that thought that one glass of water a day was enough. So increasing his water intake as well as the fact that BPH plays a big role in that. So we kind of figured that out as well. We reduced and removed inflammatory foods by doing an elimination diet. And granted, this happened in slow pieces bits by bits. We started with just the water intake and increasing the protein. And as we gained uh, kind of rapport and trust, we started to actually address an elimination diet. For him, the nightshades did make a small difference when we removed potatoes, um, being the big player there, uh, and a little bit of um, the wheat or gluten containing grains. Uh, but generally speaking, it was more of just kind of a, a check-in to see how he was feeling with and without certain foods. It wasn't a huge shift for him, but we found that when he removed wheat in general, that played a big help or a big role for him. Supplementarily, we added in glutathione in a liposomal form, vitamin C. We switched out the tamolo, or tamsolo, I can never say this one, tamsolosin uh, for a herbal prostate blend that actually ended up working way better than the Flomax that he was taking. Uh, so that was a huge win for him. And then adding in the ubiquinol because when we are on um, different types of statins for a long period of time, this depletes your body's own stores of ubiquinol. So we kind of just did this whole general reduction of inflammation through supplements. And we addressed the EPA content because like every other person, he was buying EPA or his omega-3s from uh, just a drugstore and thought that that was sufficient. So we increased that, tripled the dose that he was taking, and we saw huge shifts in the amount of pain that he felt and kind of stiffness. So he's actually off methotrexate now. Uh, he has seen changes to his blood uh, sugar management, even though on Jardians it was relatively controlled. He would get random spikes every now and again, but by switching the amount of protein he was eating, we also saw huge results there. He ended up with 15 pounds of weight loss, uh, also because of the water intake, I think, uh, as well as increased movement in hands and knees and yes, off the flow max and less frequent blood sugar spikes. So a huge win there. Yeah, exactly. And so it can show you the influence that you can have by making these again, incremental changes over time that can result in huge outcomes for patients. And that's one of the biggest things that I always say, evaluate a doctor or any clinician on their ability to get you off of medications. If they can lower your requirement for medications, then they're doing a good job. If all they're doing is supporting the same processes again and again, that's not facilitating any advancement in your healing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. Is there anything else? Well, yes. Putting it all together. This is going to be key foundational right here. Takeaways, okay. yeah. Yes. So uh, through this, of course, nutrition was the focus, but it's important to know that not one thing will make a patient better. And I think this is something really important for all practitioners because we can often get into these little bubbles where we think that our modality is kind of the modality of all modalities. And so this yeah. is just really understanding that pain is a multifactorial process. And when we can hit it from many different angles, the likelihood of our clients having sustained results is much higher. Um, so using nutraceuticals in conjunction with adjustments and different manual manipulation that can have profound acute impacts that can translate into the longer, um, yeah, the longer healing. And they accelerate the healing process while we get at the root cause. And again, yeah, we've already spoke about how this gives them hope and relief, establishes that relationship to make the larger changes. Um, and it's 
this idea of always meeting patients where oh my gosh. they are at, which Sydney mm-hmm. is really good at explaining. So take it away. <laughs> I call it client readiness, right? So when you have a client coming in and they seem hesitant or they've said, you know, my partner's told me to be here or my kids forced me to come. Yes. That's a really good sign that you want to just add a few things in, give them a few wins, um, give them something to take home that could be uh, just very passive for them to work with or something that you know that they could achieve, Right huge to start there when someone's client readiness or their readiness is low, right? Mm -hmm. So starting there is always quite important. And with every client, no matter if it's someone who is um, ready or not, adding things in first is a huge step in the right direction to gaining trust. Because when people are in pain, when people are in digestive discomfort, you name it, uh, if we start saying you can't, you can't, you can't, it creates this just mindset, right? Anytime anyone says no to you, your immediate response is to become defensive. Mm -hmm. So always adding something in to give them that, that kind of piece of a win is super important. Um, Starting, go ahead. Yeah, Lisa, Sydney, I think those are, you just hit those like nail right on the head with both of those. You're actually, the first thing you do is you give a gift of whatever else they can add to what they're doing. And the multidisciplinary management of multifactorial applications are going to result in the best outcomes. The research is pretty clear on that, whether it's, you know, nutritional counseling, whether it's going to be with exercise therapy, sleep changes, you know, some kind of manual therapy, massage, chiropractic, physio, you name it, it's all going to work together to create the optimal outcomes for your patient. Exactly. And one thing on that too, a lot of times with patients and clients, cost and time is an issue. And so when it comes to nutritional interventions, you don't always have to refer out to a nutritionist or a dietitian. You can start to do little things that are going to make a big difference and take them really far. And then, you know, of course there's always that option, but we will provide you with a handout that you can give your patients. That's a general anti-inflammatory handout so that again, you're not spending your time with your patients explaining all of this stuff in great detail, but you're still giving them that tangible um, kind of plan that's going to add value and help to see results faster and just all around make, you know, health outcomes a lot better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I think just when we start to add things in, to, with any client protocol or, or patient protocol, we kind of see this giant web. I don't know if anyone else sees things like this. Like you see this person in front of you presenting with X, Y, and Z, and you automatically go, okay, like this could happen. This could happen. I could give them this. I could help them with this. We could change this in their diet. And we see that all at once, but we have to remind ourselves, as Lisa was saying, that they have kids, they have a job, they have all of these things that take up their day. And the nutrition piece is maybe only an hour or two of their day. We might think about this stuff all the time, but they don't. So using that small approach step-by-step and celebrating the wins and then addressing the challenges is going to be a huge factor for their success. It's going to have them keep coming back to you, not dropping off, not canceling without saying anything by looking at it from that perspective. How much time do they have to do this? And how can we fit something that's winnable or kind of achievable, winnable, achievable in there for that client to see success? Excellent. Yeah. In fact, when you're looking at this, there's two ways that I I approach this. I say, number one, uh, front load it. So give them the key information, key things first. And the next thing is always minimal effective dose. What is the least that I have to do to influence these changes to cause these positive outcomes for you? That's what we're always figuring out. How can I find this balance between time and what else we're doing? Definitely. All right. right. Okay. I want to just say thank you both very much for doing this. This has been fantastic. Eye-opening for me in a lot of ways. I know I'm going to change the way that I use supplements and nutraceuticals in my practice and also the nutritional, the nutritional components that we give for patients as well. I'm going to go ahead and make sure to do that. And then you've also got the handout that we have as well. And there'll be a little Mm -hmm. quiz at the end of this potentially. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.